connecting to the cloud. Hello and welcome to Bushwick Politic. I'm Adi Eshman. I'm Jason Jones. Welcome, everybody. Hope everything is going well. Yeah. How's everything been with you, Adi? Uh, things are going well. I've uh, just been, you know, watching the news these days, looking at what's happening in Nigeria, looking at what's happening with the Supreme Court nomination. What about you? Uh, yeah, just looking at the news as well, seeing what's going on in the world. A lot is changing, hopefully for the better. Everything looks really up in the air right now. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I would agree with that. I've, I've been watching a lot of, you've turned me on to Democracy Now! So I've been watching a lot of Amy Goodman and Democracy Now! And I feel like every time she presents the news headlines, there's like a vein busting in her forehead, just like, how could it get worse than this? And every day, it seems to get a little bit worse. It's kind of crazy. I, I, it's so funny. I don't really see how she kind of takes it. She like, the way she delivers the message, it's almost like, Anyone with a brain and common sense could see this is the wrong move, yet our world leaders don't. It's... What, so what, uh, what, what's, was there anything, any one particular issue or one particular news story that you're really interested in this week? Um, yeah, actually quite a few stood out to me. Um, first one being um, the one with the uh, Brianna Taylor's case. Mm. Um, the, the new evidence and those, those jurors coming out and saying that um, you know, obviously, you know, it was, a, it was a horrible ruling. That's why everyone kind of rose up and there was additional riots in the streets. But um, the jurors are coming out and a second juror, I guess, came out recently saying that they weren't even asked about the murder within yeah. the case. That's not they didn't even, you know, go over that. Mm. So it, it's interesting how it, it's, it's almost like the cops were never really tried. Right. You know, so there still has to be an answer for that unlawful death. Right. Nothing has been nothing has really been done. There's been a there's been a kind of a, a dog and pony show, more or less. Sort of the uh, the presentation, the theater of law, but of, of justice, but not the actual justice. Yeah. And you can see the result. I mean, no one's been punished. No one's in jail. No one's facing any kind of repercussions for the unlawful death of, uh, you know, someone who was trying to help people, <laughs> an MTA worker, or not an MTA worker, but someone who was working at, at the hospitals. Um, wh what do you mean, an, an MTA worker? No, no, I mean, Brianna Taylor, she was um, uh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. an EMT. Right, an EMT, EMT. Sorry, MTA, EMT, my bad. Yeah, a lot of an, uh, but, acronyms. Uh, but, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, there was, there was that. And so that really struck me as just something that it was just like, wow, how has this still not been addressed? It's literally been months and right. nothing has been done. So it, it really calls into question, you know, the faith in the American justice system. Are our, our, our cops above the law, basically? Right. Yeah, America's essentially answered yes. Hmm. I saw, but, I saw an interview recently uh, that was recorded a while ago with the civil rights lawyer, William Kunstler, who mm -hmm. represented the Chicago Seven. And he talked about how the United States has one set of laws for, let's say, your Joe Schmo, and then one set of laws for pariahs, um, like the Chicago Seven, people who we consider outcasts. But I think what this is also showing us this time is that there's also one set of laws for you know, people who are supposed to uphold, uphold the law. Yeah, obviously. I mean, obviously that's true or else, you know, half of our Senate would be behind bars. So, so I mean, yeah, there's, there's clearly multiple sets of law within our, within our system, depending yeah. on who's, you know, who's there. Hey, oh. Siobhan, welcome. Hi, everyone. Hey, welcome. Hi, on that note, I'd love to introduce Siobhan. Uh, O'Loughlin, am I saying that right? O'Loughlin. O'Loughlin, my bad. Okay, it's not uh, easy. Uh, welcome, welcome to our show. Thanks for having me. Hello. Uh, how's everything going? Yeah, how's everything going? 
It's crazy. I just uh, I just did a training for new uh, phone bankers for the Misfits. We've got two screens of people tonight. It's a big wow. Got like almost forty people making calls to Pennsylvania. How's and that going? And on Saturday really good uh we're doing get out the vote at this point but on saturday we will be calling um we will be calling union members in the state of north carolina to make mm. sure that they're mobilizing for democrats and we will be calling uh harrison supporters in south carolina and making sure that they have a ride to the polls so uh we're doing a specific carolina's day on saturday uh and otherwise we've been very devoted to flipping the state of pennsylvania Democrats. So uh, we've contributed to making over 3 million calls to the state of Pennsylvania. And Amazing. PA Stands Up actually thinks that the misfits are responsible for 10,000 of those calls. So wow. we've, been, we've been really, I'm tired, but it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just love to, you know, to just hear from you and, and, and learn a little bit about how you got involved in this work. And then, you know, just talking about what it's been like with, with you and, and, you know, the, the voters that you're reaching out to and what those interactions are like. So I guess, you know, just to start, where, where were you four years ago? Like, what were you thinking about in terms of politics? What was Shivana Lachlan like four years ago? Yeah, so I, uh, I've been a radical activist uh, for always. Um, and in so much as I was actually registered green. So in 2016, I was a Green Party member and I had been for a decade. Mm. Um, in the state of New York, uh, I will be to I'll just be totally transparent. I voted for Jill Stein. Um, I felt very separate from the mainstream politic in general. I've worked on countless uh, third party campaigns in Baltimore County, as well as in New York City. Mm -hmm. And uh, for president, I wasn't excited about Jill Stein, but I wasn't excited about president at all. So yeah. I was actually abroad when the election was happening because I'm a performance artist and my work makes me travel all the time until now. And so I felt very separate from the entire process and I voted and I didn't uh, think much of it. I did feel that I was interested in Bernie Sanders, but because of New York's, um, the way our, our, our electoral is set up, um, it was way too late for me to change my registration to vote for him in the primary by the time I like caught on to his power. So uh, when Trump won, the main thing I felt was regret that I didn't help Bernie more and that I had been too pure in my progressive politics to not help someone who might be a Democrat, even though I don't identify as a Democrat and I don't like most democratic platforms. So I changed my registration shortly after that, uh, partly because I worked on a campaign just a year later in 2017 in New York City for city council, which is our uh, now quite famous Jabari Brisport, who yeah, was yeah. not famous then. Uh, he was running as a green in uh, for city council in Brooklyn um, as a Green member and also a DSA member. So from working on that campaign, I uh, joined the Democratic Socialists of America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We lost, uh, we lost that election. Uh, we got 30%, which for a third party is great, but also not good enough. And um, I realized that the, uh, you know, presidential primary would be coming up. And because of Bernie's kind of movement, there were great, for the first time I felt, uh, for the midterms, there were other uh, electoral um, candidates who were quite progressive running as Democrats. So I spent time back in Baltimore volunteering for Ben Jealous's campaign. He was a very radical uh, candidate running for governor and would have been the first black governor of Maryland. And also someone, also a, a Bernie delegate and endorsed by our revolution. I also worked uh, on Stacey Abrams campaign as well as our fallen Beto. And so, uh, <laughs> I, um, so I found myself actually very much a registered Democrat and involved in lots of Democratic campaigns that were progressive. And of course, threw myself and my heart and soul into uh, Bernie Sanders' uh, 2020 bid. Um, and so that was very big for me and uh, uh, just a massive heartbreak when we lost him which is when uh, at the same time I was working on DSA campaigns for Ferris Front Forest and of course, Jabari again, this time running for state Senate. Uh, we won, we won big, we won lots of candidates uh, here in the city of New York for um, assembly and Senate. And we're yep. very proud of our victories. Uh, and it was, it involved us being uh, addicted to the dialer and very much in quarantine and making um, phone calls most nights of the week 
to make mm -hmm. sure that uh, these candidates won. So uh, that kind of brings us to now, I guess, if that's a nice primer for you. That's a great primer. <laughs> great. Yeah, it definitely is. So it sounds, it sounds to us like you, you're, you're on your job like all the time. It sounds pretty nonstop. Can you, tell, can you take us through what an average day is like within the organization? Like, you know, how many, how many phone calls are you going through? How many people are actually answering? Sure. Uh, I also want to be clear that I'm a volunteer. I've never gotten paid to work on a political campaign. I uh, am an artist, and but I also consider myself an activist. And I think that um, <laughs> it's important for me to be able to sleep at night by doing my civic duty to help make sure that we're not on the brink of extinction. So um, uh, I'm working with Pennsylvania Stands Up and an organization called the All Hands Brigade, when I started the misfits because I kind of was panicking about Trump winning, even though I don't very much care for Joe Biden. So I um, just wanna make that clear. Uh, on the dialer, we're on, we're on the dialer um, three days a week, averaging about 10 hours a week. Uh, again, everyone on the misfits is a volunteer, no one's getting paid. Um, and we're working with a great progressive organization called Pennsylvania Stands Up. So, um, uh, it's a it, it's a crapshoot. I don't know. You 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 dial in and you wait, and it connects you to calls, and lots of people hang up, or you get awkwardly disconnected. Or one of our members in our meeting just now was like, "You know what? I feel like someone telling me to go fuck my mother is a is is really what's keeping me going these days. Like I'm making <laughs> calls, and you know I'm really I'm really in it. I'm in the trenches here. So um, we are uh you know i would say that if you have in a three hour shift which is how we operate if you have five good conversations then you've done an excellent job you might only have one to three good conversations and by conversations i mean an actual exchange of human beings telling stories mm -hmm. talking about what they care about and why right um if you have one to three of those then like that's really righteous because uh, lots of people will hang up on you, you know? So, I mean, the reality is that it's unsexy, that it's very humbling when you're like, hi, I'm a volunteer. I just want to see if you're voting. And they're like, click. And you're like, okay. And then you get another call, <laughs> you know? So I encourage my volunteers to bring drinks or snacks or vaping pens, whatever you need to take care of yourself as you go through this very humbling experience of hours of, you know, phone banking. <laughs> How many hours would you say you have phone banking that you have you done this election cycle? I mean, I'm on it. Uh, just <laughs> uh, we've been running. We've been doing just the misfits for a month. But before I was organizing a group, I was doing it myself. I mean, I would say I remember ten hours a week. That's been a month. How many? I'm bad at math. I, I don't know. A hundred hours. <laughs> hours. <laughs> You're probably hundred uh, hours. Well, I'd lo I'd love to know. I mean, I think stories are great. Uh, and you're an artist, you love storytelling. Um, what, uh, what are some good stories, some good interactions that, that you've had with, with voters in Pennsylvania? Yeah, so I think um, one of the things we, we really talk about is uh, affirmations. And um, when you speak to a voter, uh, you're considering everyone a potential voter, uh, unless they're like, hey, I'm, I'm a 10 for Trump. And you're like, all right, I'm gonna get out of this conversation here. But uh, I think what's most important is to hear them for where they are at. So um, for me, I have a special in as a previous third party person. So when I'm con communicating with, let's say, I, I find them a lot more than greens, but libertarians, right? I don't agree with libertarians. I don't really understand the money being just as important as social justice. I don't really understand that, but okay. When they're like, well, I'm I am voting, but I'm voting for for Jorgensen, then I'll uh, then I have an in to have that conversation, and I can say like, hey, I actually really understand that because I I'm coming from the Green Party, and I don't identify with either of these political parties either. But something that's important to me um, is that I think that if Trump wins again, we are going to be risking our democracy entirely. We may not ever get the chance to vote for our actual values again. This election rides on democracy, on our fragile democracy surviving. And so I'm asking you to consider, you know, voting for Biden because uh, I'm afraid that we won't have the chance to ever give our third party's representation someday uh, as long as he has all of this power. So mm. kind of having these conversations of saying like, I see you and I hear you and then they're like, oh, but these, you know, okay, but these 
libertarian issues are important to me. And you're like, yeah, totally. But also as a libertarian, your democracy is important to you. So that was a conversation that I had that, um, that was uh, where I was able to meet him, you know, where he's at, and then tell a little bit of my story and where I came from and why like, yeah, I'm not even actually a Democrat and I'm not asking you to vote. Uh, I'm not asking you to vote for a person right now, in this case, right, with him. I'm asking you to vote for, uh, for democracy, which is something that we both, w I, can, can we find common ground on? You know, um, so that doesn't always work. People are like, I'm gonna vote for who I'm voting for. And you learn when you need to back down. But uh, I think um, talking to the, my team of misfits about re finding the humanity in these people, even when you're like, oh my God, how could you vote for a third party in a swing state? I agree. And actually in 2016, if I was in a swing state, I would have voted blue if I wasn't, right? But you can't talk to people like that. You have to see people as people. We have to understand that these people are being gaslit by our system. They do not trust our democracy in their first place. They haven't been seen or respected. They haven't seen change implemented, even when they're bullied into voting for it, right? Mm -hmm. so we have to come to a place of, 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 of trusting their instincts and their feelings and honoring that even as we're trying to persuade them to vote for Joe Biden. Wow, thank you. And you kind of you kind of uh, touched on a, another question I was going to ask you, um, Siobhan. What do you do when you you talk to someone and they're just a one issue voter? Uh, you know, someone who says, um, you know, I support Trump because he's uh, you know pro mining, and my grandpa worked in the mine, and my dad worked in the mine, and I work in the mine. You know, what do you say to those people in Pennsylvania? Because those people frustrate the hell out of me. I literally can't see through it. But how do you, as someone who's actually on the ground trying to persuade these people, go about it? Because for me, it's like talking to a brick wall. The first sure. instinct is to attack. So how do you do it? Sure. So so my instinct is to go for an is to go to an emotional place then. And I say, like, hey, I I really respect that. Um, I'm calling because I have two baby nieces and I'm concerned about the planet and my family. So I really want them to have clean air and clean water to drink. And I completely respect your position as, as a minor and your job. And I want that to be there, but I also want our planet to be safe enough for us to all be able to continue to work. And, you know, do you have kids and do you have, or do you have young people that you care about? Um, and I'll try to kind of speak to them from a really personal place. And I think that family is a place that most of us have some sort of connection, you know? Um, and I think that that allows me, I just, I just try to go vulnerable in those places. Cause I can't argue about mining and Trump. I just want to be like, Trump doesn't care about you. Right? Like, <laughs> that's what you want to say. You're like, yo, you have been gaslit. You have been duped, but you can't say that. And you just say, Hey, I respect that. You know? And, and this is a place where I'm coming from for me personally. That's why I'm making these calls. And I'll say like, does that make sense? Like, like, do you get me, you know, like I'll kind of come to that place like I hear you do you hear what I'm saying like this is where I'm coming from uh so that's my go-to that's my like the climate is my constant uh platform that I lean on when I'm mm -hmm. advocating for Biden have you have you been able to sway some hearts and minds have you have you felt like you've been able to sway some hearts and minds in your phone calls I have, but most often, and I think that all volunteers, you know, know this and understand this is like, they're not going to necessarily give you that victory. Yeah. They'll be like, they'll be like, well, I'll think about it, you know? And if I can get people to consider, then I'll say, Hey, if I can just get you to consider voting for Joe, I really appreciate that. Right. So I'll just come from a really, they don't want to give you the victory, even when they're like, you made a good point or, Oh, actually, you know, I do, I see what you're saying. Right. Um, and you have to take that as like, I've done good, you know, because they're going to, and I believe that if you're speaking to an empathetic and kind person who is listening to you on the phone, when you tick your box off at the ballot, you will, I believe that they will remember the misfits and they will remember us being kind and listening to them, you know? Yeah. Wow. Well, it's, it's, it sounds like you really are making a great impact and I mean, I, I do like what you said about appealing to people on an emotional level. Honestly, you know, we we find in these these talks that, you know, when we try to appeal to people on a uh, more 
educational level or, you know, try to appeal to their sense of humanity. That doesn't always work. You know, it, it just, we miss people. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Oh, it's true. And I think like part of this too, you know, when I talk about it, I feel like I'm a general and I'm like, okay, so I'm your general and I'm sending you out there. You know, you've got three kinds of people. You're going to, you're, you've got three, like in this battlefield, you've got three kinds of mm, spirits that you might encounter. And one of them is going to be uh, your Biden supporters. Our goal with them is to empower them to vote. So making sure that they know how they're voting, they've got a plan, they know about the secrecy envelope in Pennsylvania and that they're good to go and making sure that they're talking to their friends and family about Joe Biden. If you've got your undecided, so those are like your allies. Cool, cool, got you, we agree. You set, you're set, go forth. Um, your, uh, your undecideds are our targets. So if, you're, if you've got a crossbow and you're looking for who to hit and you come across an undecided, that's your, your like charge ahead. You are gonna have a vulnerable conversation with that person and tell them your story and find a way to hopefully push the needle a little bit for Joe. Your Trump supporters, they've got the TKO on you. What they do is they suck your life force like fucking, I'm sorry, like vampire. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> and they no really no children watch this show. <laughs> Um, Adi, I don't know if you remember Oliver. He comes to many of our sessions, but I like totally like yelled at Oliver. I was like, I was like, you were on the phone for 45 minutes with somebody? Hell no. Like you're wasting my time. Get out of there. He's sucking your life force. You're too good on the phones to be spending that long with a Trump voter who's not listening to you. So like when those Trump voters come at you and they love to waste your time, right? You got to get out of there because you're not going to convince them. And our job is to work on those undecideds and to empower Biden voters. So we, we're doing right now, we're doing a lot of get out the vote, right? Ballot chasing. So we're like, you got it. You, did you order it? I'm going to track it for you and see where it is, right? We're really trying to make sure that everyone's vote gets in for Joe in Pennsylvania. Amazing. Thanks for, thanks for tearing that for us and, and letting <laughs> us know, you know, what the, what the battlefield is looking like on the phones over there. But um, I, I was, that was another one of my questions. I mean, how often do you run into undecided people? Are, are, are these people with head in the sand? Do they not watch the news? What are these people saying where they're undecided? These At people. Yeah. What, what are people saying? I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I really want to know who is undecided at this point. Yeah. Where are these people? I'm so glad you're asking. They're in Pennsylvania. They're in our battleground states. They're in North Carolina and Wisconsin and Michigan and they are undecided for a lot of reasons. The most common reason that I find people to be undecided is because they do not believe in our democracy. They do not believe that their vote matters because they understand that the electoral college is gonna come in and avert things and divert things. And we might say, but you're in a swing state. So like, what are you talking about? But of course that's not, you know, so what I'm constantly reminding the misfits is to remember that these people who are undecided have been gaslit by our system their entire lives. I mean, I am someone who has felt outside of the system and I'm, an, I'm educated, you know, and, I'm, and I have resources, right? So if you're someone who works 10 to 12 hours a day and you don't read the news because you you're not on Twitter, so you're not reading the news that way, you don't get a newspaper, maybe you don't ever turn on the news, right? You don't have a, radios aren't a thing anymore. You can actually, if you, picture it, you can keep yourself pretty much outside of the goings on. Also, you know, we talk about going to war, you know, with George Bush, we talk about these things. We're not necessarily directly seeing how that is impacting working class people, right? When they're not like following acutely everything that's happening and how it is directly impacting them and how these recessions have to do with our leadership. When people talk about power, in the government, the government, right? Like city council, state assembly. Like, like you ask most people what a comptroller is, <laughs> they may not actually know, right? Americans are not comfortable talking about positions of power because we have been societally structured not to do so. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not without intention that people don't have the tools to think that these things directly involve them, that they know, they, that, that they know about it, that they should know about it and that it impacts them and that they have a tangible say. And what we have to do when people are saying like, well, yeah, I don't, why would I vote? Like, I don't, 
I, I, this system has nothing to do with me and nothing I do matters and they don't care about me. Our job is to say, I understand where you're coming from. I see exactly why you feel that way, right? I'm asking you to make, I'm asking you one more time. I'm asking you to step out this time for me, for yourself, for your, someone else in your life, because I hope that this time we can change the electoral college and you don't feel that way. Right. Yeah. That's the number one reason why people are undecided is because they're just like, I don't know if I should vote because I don't think my vote matters, which is which is <laughs> oppression in practice. Right. That like our system is directly oppressive. And that is part of the issue. The second thing, the second most common reason will be that they like something about Trump's policies. Like, well, I don't want to defund the police. I hate Trump. He's a terrible asshole, but I don't want to defund the police. Right. So that's where, so like, well, you know, Biden wants to abolish the police. So I don't want to vote for him because, right. So that will be the, the second most common situation where people are undecided, where they, they think that they like some of Trump's platforms, um, but they don't like him as a person. And Joe, let's be real. I'm sorry, Joe lovers. He's not the most inspiring man. He's just not, he doesn't elicit Charisma and passion, I think, I, I feel. So, so it's our You're the only one who thinks that, Siobhan. <laughs> You're very much alone on that. <laughs> so it's our job then to say, hey, um, <laughs> Biden's not gonna defund the police. I wish. One of the things we say when they're like, well, he's a socialist. We're like, hey, he's not at the meetings. I go to the meetings and he's not at the meetings. Yeah. No <laughs> so, one on the, on the Biden campaign? Yeah, you know, yeah, no, nope, not at the uh, the socialist meetings. So, um, so those are the main two reasons why you're finding uh, folks who are who are undecided. Uh, also, people in swing states understand that they have a little more power than, you know, us in California or in New York, right? So they're like, well, yeah, I don't know because I actually get to kind of like weigh in here, and I'm not sure. It sounds wild, but again, we just have to remember what this system is and that if you're more educated or in different kinds of communities where this stuff is more part of your bubble, we have to remember that we are in those bubbles and it's our job to understand that and, and remain compassionate. I, I, I love that, thank you. Um, I, I guess when you said something about, um, about how the system is, is really asking us to not see these things, I wonder if you could also weigh in on this idea that I've, I've, I've felt being you know, someone who's lived in New York and LA for my whole life, um, that the system also asks people who are living in these, let's say, uh, wealthier areas, you know, more educated areas, to also not really be thinking about people in, in areas with, less res with fewer resources. Um, you know, what, does the system also encourage that sort of separation, the mental geographic separation between those two groups of people? Um, between folks in like rural, um, uh, rural so, areas and urban areas. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly feel that if we had chosen to be a country that had public transportation and, and, uh, not be a car driven country, that <laughs> car driven country. Yep. I said that. Um, then I think that uh, a lot of these problems could be looking quite differently because we would have more access. I think there'd be less racism. We'd have more access to each other. We moving through our country. Uh, I, I think that would have been a drastic, uh, made a big difference for us um, here. So, you know, I think, you know, European countries, they do have their problems, absolutely, but they tend to actually, even so, even with the, with the dickheaded ruler that they have in the UK right now, people were still much better taken care of during COVID mm. uh, than we are here. And I think that, that, you know, public transport and access to places might have something to do with that. Free healthcare. Imagine. Government healthcare. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> Free education. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jason, do you have any other questions? Um, yeah, I think I just had one last one. Um, so say, or actually a few, um, you know, you travel the world a lot, you know, doing your performance art. Are there any lessons that you've picked up from your travels that you've been able to adapt to, you know, calling for Biden and, you know, your whole strategy here? Absolutely. I just did a, an interview with the, with no proscenium about, they're like, are you hosting these immersive phone banks? And I'm like, that's funny. Sure. Immersive phone banks. It's a, it's a play. It's a play with an activism. Yeah. <laughs> it's well, absolutely. And I think that my experience, um, 
So the piece that I traveled the world doing, uh, which, a doc, which I'm making a documentary of right now is called Broken Bone Bathtub. And I perform in bathtubs in people's homes around the world. And it's about a bike accident I had in New York City where I broke my arm. And then I was borrowing bathtubs of my friends because I didn't have a bathtub of my own. And my friends were giving me a bath. So in the performance, I tell them, I tell the audience gives me a bath. And then I tell them about what happened to me and uh, about things that have happened to them. And I think that actually uh, performing this in different um, in different cities and different states and different communities and neighborhoods uh, globally has helped me to be a better activist. And uh, in this case, um, I think, you know, the art of listening is a workshop that I think that I teach that is important, I think, for solo performers, which I am like more than considering yourself a teller, you should be a, a listener, you know? And so uh, when you learn to listen, then you're opening yourself up to a better creative experience, but also a better um, experience as an activist. So when you're talking to people, you know, when I was canvassing for Bernie or when I'm on the phones for Farah and Jabari or uh, now on the phones for Joe, um, we're coming from a place of, uh, of listening, which I think actually we, and the misfits in particular, we're mostly artists, honestly, progressive artists. We're coming from a place of like being empaths and being people who have experience in, in, in listening and sharing in our creative practice. And so I think all of my experiences and learning how to do that in different places, right? So the Irish like sarcasm. If you tease them and fuck with them a little bit and make fun of them, they're actually more likely to tell you their personal story because they trust you a little bit because you've reach them through some humor, right? Mm. You know, and the Japanese, uh, in all, you know, they they uh, are not so comfortable with touching, but they really respect the authority in the room. So in the bathtub, and I'm asking them to do a thing, I'm finding a way to gain trust with them uh, that is not invasive of touching and contact and personal space, but what else makes me inviting uh, in addition to them understanding that they want to follow because they're in the bathtub with me, bathroom with me as the person conducting the, the space. So mm -hmm. I think learning about different people and seeing uh, how different cultures respond and react to creative practice is not that different from how you're doing it on the phone. When what you're trying to do is just um, reach people from the heart and be vulnerable, which is synonymous with being brave. Wow, wow. awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Siobhan. Thank you. I appreciate y'all. It's so nice to meet. It's like uh, Jason. It's great to meet you. I Very nice to meet you as well. <laughs> thank you for being a part of the Misfits. We uh, we love having you when, when you're able to make. I, it. I will sure. I will definitely be back. Uh, I think the Misfits is a great space. I, I feel there. I felt very uncomfortable in a lot of different phone banking scenarios because I was like, I don't love Joe. This is strange. Are we just? Are we not going to name the fact that he's not? Like this is a very strange world that we're living in, um, and I loved I loved also the fact that there were a lot of artists and a lot of other creative people in the Misfit phone bank. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we're still calling up until uh, election day, and then we're probably going to have like phone banking party day, not phone banking, just like a bonding time, which we're calling the um, like a dialer rehab because we're like addicted to the dialer at this point. <laughs> But, well, when, uh, we, when we post this rec uh, recording online, we'll also include information about Misfits for how people can, can check it out. Awesome. Yeah. The bit.ly slash Misfits for Biden. Uh, that's not going to click through because I didn't do like the HTTP. But yeah, they can sign up and with my form there and, and come join us. And we will take new people and we're down to the wire. And our job right now is to not be complacent. We're up 10 points in Pennsylvania almost, but we are holding the line. And so uh, that's our job for the next, I don't know, what is it, 12 days? Oh my God. <laughs> Come join us. We're going to sleep on November 4th. <laughs> Thank you so much, Siobhan. Thanks Thank you for so having much. Me. Great to see you. Great to see you thanks too. So much. Well, thanks Bye. so much for joining us this week, everyone. Uh, I'm Adi Eshman. I'm Jason Jones. Thanks again, guys. We'll see you next week. Bye.